uh, at the Christmas party, like Sarah said, was, was like, oh, and they're also super nice dudes who were very excited to play these parts, and you couldn't you couldn't ask for anything better. You know? And such a handy thing that we found a real alcoholic and a real 14-year-old boy. <laughs> that was really critical to the search. It's a, a lot of people can do the voices, but we wanted the authenticity. How fucking an alcoholic are you? It's method act. <laughs> Harry doesn't like it. That should be an HR offense. To keep, we keep calling him 14, and that's not cool. That's no, flattering. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's been incredibly uh, wonderful to have them on the show. I have been doing some of the conventions with them as well, and to just have people to hang out with as well while we're meeting all of our fans together, and I wouldn't have the opportunity to continue being on the show if we weren't able to have these two lovely, wonderful guys come in and do these voices incredibly, as well as bring like their own acting skills to, the, to it as well. So I am just very grateful that we got to, you guys found them. And now they're my best friends and we play Magic the Gathering. That's right. Thank you guys. Scott and Dan, I'm coming your way now, but before we dig into some uh, season eight information, I, I did want to lean into the fan base you two have uh, created and continued growing with this show over the years. So. You've also been to your fair share of conventions and made exciting announcements, but I feel like every step of the way, like, what that can mean to you as artists evolves. So what does it mean to be right here at New York Comic Con and celebrating season eight with a room full of people who are very clearly enthusiastic about your show? I mean, it's super exciting for me. I, I'm usually chained to a radiator in the writer's room, so I'm not allowed out a lot. Uh, so this is very surreal. No, this is, this is amazing. This is what it's all about. I feel entitled to it. Um, it's normal for me, and I'll complain at home when it's not happening. I'll, I'll yell at my family for not being 3,000 people. Where's the fanfare? <laughs> Why aren't you applauding me making toast? Uh, no, it always, it, it never gets old, and I, 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 if anything, like, the, the more times I get to do it, the more I keep pounding in my head. I'm like, God, you're going to miss this, because nothing can last forever, and I just go, like, you've got to remember this. Um, it's an, it's, everyone should get to feel it. It's very therapeutic. Like, we'll do it after the show. It might take a while, but each one of you should come up and be called the executive producer of something and have everybody <laughs> affirm you. Because it feels good. It really is very special what you created. And because of that, I have a feeling we've got a whole bunch of people out there who want to hear a little bit about the new season. So I will begin with the two of you on that. Can you give us a little update? At what point of the process are you in right now? And how much more do you have to go until it's finished? Uh, we are, believe it or not, uh, almost done writing the first pass of season 10. So we're really far, and it's awesome. Uh, it's super exciting. We're really moving. It's pretty good. I'm pretty excited. I'm also thinking about a whole bunch of other things I want to ask, but I have to wait. For the cast now, I don't want to spoil anything, of course, but just to give everyone a sense of what they should be looking out for most in uh, season eight, can you each tell me which episode of the new season you are most excited for fans to see and give us a little tease why? <laughs> uh, I don't know if we can answer that. Uh, <laughs> I have been given approval to ask that question. Oh, You're safe. I I'm excited. Well, I sometimes get like one big episode, so I always get really excited to see that. You know, like the summer episode. So, uh, um, I, I particularly like this one, though. It's, I think it's a different side that we haven't yet seen in summer, so I'm excited about it. I love you, I love you too. These are gentlemen we paid to stand back. <laughs> My cousin. But you're, you're, you're earning your pay. I mean, it's just one, it's, a, it's actually an automated kiosk. It, uh, it's a keyboard, you know, it'll, it'll be saying, I love you, Ant Man 3, in a couple of uh, 44 minutes. <laughs> we love you too, Jerry. Jerry, we love oh. you, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah, there's a Jerry. Jerry. There's a Jerry episode, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, there's something to do with a certain holiday that doesn't get featured very often in shows. I don't know if we can say what holiday it is. But... 
I just don't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I'll, I'll let her so that I don't have to keep track of the seasons anymore. <laughs> I, I keep it under wraps. Yeah. Keep, okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, I, I can be vague and say that in the past, um, there have been some really fun episodes with multiple iterations of Rick's and multiple iterations of Morty's. And so I'm, I'm excited to share some other new versions of Rick that might, that might be coming your way. Oh. Oh. I did a episode, I think my favorite moment we got to record was the second episode and um, you know it's one of the funnest parts about working on this show is you never know every season what's going to happen and the kinds of things you're going to have to do so one of the funnest things for me was getting to do Space Beth and trying to figure out how to differentiate her a bit from Beth and this year um, I got to do another version of Beth. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So nervous. Um, I, here's what I can say. There's an episode that actually has Rick and Morty together. <laughs> so uh, I just I can't wait for you all to see that, and that's all I'm gonna say. Some rock solid teases right there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with the cast for a minute and push push my luck in terms of teasing new elements of your characters. I'm gonna try to keep it safe by approaching this from the perspective of a voice actor. Can you each tell me something about your character season eight storyline that challenged you in a new way as a voice actor? Something that you had to do that maybe added a new tool to your voice acting toolkit, so to speak. Well, it's just acting. I don't know if I, can, I can't really say that one, but yes, there was, yeah, I think so. I don't know. Yeah, yeah same. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. my answer too, yes. I felt an electric shock for my last answer, so I'm just gonna... <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, like when I record Space Beth, I always do her second because she's kind of more raspy. And so for this other thing that we did this season in the second episode, um, it was a similar experience of going in and to the booths and with Martyr, us trying different things and uh, till we kind of hit on what we wanted it to be. But that's like, I mean, we've literally had that once a season, like obviously with like Night Person figuring you go to the booth and you're like, what will that sound like? <laughs> we had to try so many different versions till we got to like what all of us were gonna do for that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I'll take that. That's all I can say. <laughs> safe? I feel like you were all pretty safe. In conclusion, yes, and we got, we got, got pretty meaty. We actually have an there. audio clip of the episode where it's a very meta storyline um, where Rick is uh, forbidding Morty to go into the vault of spoilers. Um, I think, do you guys want to play that audio clip, uh, Ian and Harry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hit that soundboard with the buttons. Um, uh, so, uh, I just felt an electric shock, Morty. Uh, yeah. So you better not say anything. If you felt it, uh, imagine how I feel. Oh yeah, they, they dialed it up to 11 for you, buddy. Yeah, but I, like, I really want to go in there, Rick. I, I think we should just play it safe and say nothing at all. Uh, and you don't know anything. Oh, but like it's so tempting, you know, to tell them all about, or maybe the, you know, you're right. Uh, I, I, I should just let's go back to tell you or something. Just, just tell the audience that we have an episode together. They'll never guess that. Oh, that's so good. That's so funny and clever. Wow. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good episode. It's kind of inside. It's gonna look good. see the version that's in Italian. Can you do that one next, please? Before we show a little something, which is going to happen, I'm very excited about that. Scott and Dan, I wanted to come your way just to talk about the, uh, the voice recording process a little because, you know, we've been through a lot in recent years, things have changed, so what would you say is the biggest evolution in terms of how you like to run the voice recording process now? A lot of yelling. I mean, they yell at us a lot. You know, can you do it better, Chris? Um, faster, louder, funnier. I'm usually screaming a lot. I'm a real screamer. Uh, a lot of curse. Uh, 
I, I'd say the nicest thing out of the last couple of years is just getting to do it in person a lot more, which we haven't been able yeah. to do for a long time. So like getting to see these guys like physically at a studio and being right outside the booth has been really, we're just getting cooler, better performances, kind of feeling each other more rather than just being on Zoom for everything. So that's been a nice treat. I mean, I love these guys. It's, it's so fun to get to do this show together. All right. I think it, it's close to time. I think we need to share a little something. But before we share this particular thing with all of you, first of all, I, I will say we don't often get to see animation in this particular stage. And I think it's really cool to see the evolution of it and what it takes to get it to the finished product. But I think we need a little bit of like an animatic 101 just to make sure everybody knows like what it takes to get to this point and also what comes after it. So can you explain a little bit about what we're about to see? Uh, sure. We're about to see an animatic of a season 8 episode. Animatics like right smack in the middle of the process. Like normally episodes start off as drafts, which become radio plays, which become thumbs, which is like the most crude sort of version of the animation. And then once we rewrite it a million times, it then becomes an animatic, which is kind of the black and white version of the show. And then once we write, rewrite that a million times, it then becomes color, which is the version of the show that people get to see. Alright, you guys want to see one? See that? <laughs> You're about to learn the horrible fate of the Oak Point High lacrosse team, whose annual retreat took a bloody turn. But this podcast isn't about autopsies or graphic reports of their fascinating murders. We're not here to do that. We too bad. Someone else will. It's a big market, man. Quiet ship detected. Ooh, power still on mine? Do you think, Morty? A bunch of sleeping beauties? Wanna go tap on some glass? Uh, that could be fun. Uh, we, we haven't done one of those in a while. Think they have a basketball court? Basketball court, huh? All this life. Shit, look at this place. Damn, Morty, it ain't just your run of the mill art ship. This thing is gold plated. Wow, well, where do you think they're going? Colonizing a new planet? <laughs> Looks like these guys flung themselves into space after wrecking their home world. This would be like taking candy from a baby, if that baby was in a coma. Oh, we're, we're robbing them? They robbed their planet first, Morty. Whoa, mama, you see this, Morty? Uh, this thing is fancy. Computer said it's got super rare hyper coal inside. The, the planet they left is a husk, Morty. They, they sucked their marble dry. Access denied. Huh. All right, on second thought, let's just blow a hole in the ship and drag a vault over. What? Help me with these charges. I'm uh, probably taking candy from a baby, but I draw the line at blowing up the stroller. Get down, Morty. I'm not to clear in the ground, baby. Oh. Oh. God damn it, Morty. Look what you did. because you're kind of used to the process, or does it become more challenging because you have to keep them fresh every single time you do it? I feel like there's a big challenge that, because over the generations of writer's rooms and things, it's like you become like the multiverse show, the portal gun show, and sometimes the challenge is in a less is more mindset. We, that, but those are, my, those are my favorite things is when we get to, without retconning, without bumping with anything else, we, the universe is so vast that we've created that you get to just randomly dial in on an absolutely classic trope. And I, I do love doing that most of all. I love, I love the episodes that feel like they may as well be the first episode that anyone can jump on board. It's obviously two dudes in a spaceship answering a distress beacon, and you know, you're familiar with the trope of the arc in space, people asleep and going to things, and it's just you're meeting these two characters. And I, I yeah, I think the only challenge is that sometimes we, if we feel like we do owe so much cleverness and so much um, reinvention of the wheel, and 
it, 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 things can feel unremarkable, and yet it's exactly what the doctor ordered. Is, is that a, you, you're, you're going to say, well, the challenge is Dan talking like this at everyone in the writer's room like we're idiots and just nodding our heads and then writing the cold open. Uh, a funny little tidbit of stuff like that is that in, internally I wasn't prepared for the fact that we have to animate them nude before we blur them out. So internally we see Rick and Morty naked a lot, which is really I insane. saw that version. <laughs> yes. You're, you're never prepared for, whoa, okay. Um, so that's always just a weird detail. Uh, now it's awesome when we come upon a, like a quote-unquote classic Rick and Morty, because like, they're ultimately the most fun to sort of write for them, playing off of each other. And this is a really cool one. Fans are going to love this one. Well, that is something that I really wanted to ask about. What is it like figuring out when you kind of need a classic Rick and Morty standalone adventure versus something that services, you know, the overall evolution of these characters and storyline? Definitely trying to look at the season from like 20,000 feet and keep an eye on like making sure we're hitting each character across the season and that they're all getting a focus and making sure we're hitting a little bit of canon, a little bit of silliness, a little bit of Rick and Morty classic stuff. I mean, I was a fan too before I got to right here, so you know, uh, I know what I want in a season, so we certainly try to make sure we can capture it all in 10 episodes. So I just kind of veered into the importance of those standalone classic adventures, but I also do want to highlight how the vibe between Rick and Morty has changed over the course of the series. How would you maybe define their relationship in season eight compared to previous seasons? I think they're evolving a little bit. Like, uh, he'll, he'll always be his skittish little grandson, but like, they're kind of becoming a little bit more like, we use the term Cheech and Chong a lot. Like, uh, just like a little bit more on a level playing field of just being like, you know, silly buddies. Like that's, that's sort of a journey they're kind of going on, which, which is neat. Ian and Harry, I'll loop you in on that one. Are there any, I mean, even if it's like a subtle difference in your voice performance, something that you're aiming, you aim to do in season eight that kind of differentiated how you approach the relationship in the last season? Um, I, yeah, I think my approach is just to bring, just make sure that I'm bringing myself and, and my own story into the character uh, to serve the overall story. So, uh, you know, hopefully that, that strengthens the relationship and honors the evolution that the characters are on. Um, and, you know, anything that's achieved vocally that might come out on a different take, just as a result of trying to mine for, for that truthful stuff, um, you know, hopefully hopefully comes through. Um, and from that clip, just to answer your earlier question, uh, you heard a burp towards the beginning. I can at it's least really promise. getting his burps down. We've been working on burps. We've been doing a lot more, so I can I can at least promise that without spoiling too much. I mean, you heard the audio. <laughs> All right, there you go. How's that? Yeah! I'm obsessed with that with acting in general. Just you, you always focus on the big performance beats, but sometimes it's the most difficult in the world to recreate the, the most basic everyday things, believably. Like, I don't know, like fake waking up, fake sneezing, fake burping, things well, like the, that. The truthful thing inside of me is the burp. That's all I was referring to. <laughs> That's your truth. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Ian. And like, um, yeah, I think for, for me, if, if there is anything different vocally, it's probably just a result. It's, uh, it's unconscious and it's a result of like becoming more comfortable in the role. Um, having more time to kind of take our time on season eight because season seven was so fast and furious, you know, and um, and maybe even like you know getting to know Ian better and, and maybe that dynamic leads through into Rick and Morty. I don't know, you know. He and I have gotten very close uh, uh, over the past you know year um, working together and and with the rest of the cast as well, you know, like uh, having them be so accepting of us. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like and I hope that it kind of come comes through in the work.